Welcome to Talk Time with Max Contact, the podcast where we talk about the latest contact center and customer experience, industry news, and insights. Join us as we welcome industry experts, discuss actionable strategies you can apply to your business, and help professionals like you on your path to long-term career progression and success. I'm your host, Sean McIver. Hi all, welcome to Talk Time with Max Contact. I'm Sean McIver, your host, and joining me today is James Ravel. He's a director of contact centers at Whistle UK. James has extensive experience in leading global contact center teams, previously at Air France KLM, and now at Whistle UK. He enjoys and excels in managing relationships between organizations and employees whilst working tirelessly to minimize the costs and maximize the quality of customer experiences. Welcome, James. I hope I got that okay for you for an introduction. Is there anything you would want to add to that? Oh, that's great. That's really good. Thank you very much indeed. A real pleasure to be here. Yes, it's been a long time in customer service. Now it started off 25 years ago. Oh, gosh. On the phones, as they say, and not look back. It's been a great journey. Enjoyed it thoroughly. Excellent. And actually, that's a really great starting point from my point of view. Going from, I believe it was frequent flyer advisor to, if you'll forgive this shameless pun, flying high as a director, is that's a huge journey arc to have been on. What were some kind of critical moments that served as major turning points in your professional career in operations? Yeah, well, it's a funny one because it really, when I started off as an advisor, I was on a nine-month contract. And after that nine-month contract came up, I moved into commercial side. And whereas I had a good time in commercial, it wasn't until a few years later when I came back into the customer service arena, still with Air France KLM, but I moved away from the commercial back to contact center as an operations manager. Well, that really was kind of an epiphany for me because I really discovered at that point just how much I loved it. And it really became a great journey from there on in discovering, going through all the different changes that have happened, both within the airline industry and also critically within customer service. At a time where I think customer service became more integral to companies and it was seen really, or contact centers were seen really more important and a major part of strategies rather than uniquely cost centers, which are perhaps dismissed as previously. So being part of that and contributing to that, that's been, yeah, that has been really great. And in terms of often when I think of these sorts of journeys that people successful like yourself have been on, one of the things that I find interesting is that there's an attitude of you don't fail, you learn. And so through that lens, I guess I would ask, Are there any learnings that were ultimately challenges at the time that you later absolutely treasured? I think crisis management, you know, when there is something, I go back to airline airline days because there are things that happen which are really out of control, difficult to foresee. The volcano, the Icelandic volcano, for example, suddenly out of nowhere, and then you've got the whole airline network is grounded for ages, and that really was a crisis. And just managing that and trying to get that balance between people and uh, your customers during those difficult times, it's like a different mode. So I think it's really having that uh, kind of energy through that to see you through, even at times where things seem absolutely desperate. And then I think that put us in good stead, I think, from, and I think every industry saw this is when COVID came along. Absolutely, you cannot, could not have foreseen that coming. And then, yeah, it it completely blindsided everybody. And you really had to go into kind of crisis mode, an extended crisis mode, which I think was really particular and peculiar on this this occasion. And that required, I think, superhuman amounts of energy for everybody living through that to try and get through that. So it kind of gave some kind of lesson, but it really did push it to the extreme. Yeah, I think from my point of view, it's worth pointing out that old adage of camaraderie thrives in adversity. And I think we really saw that through that period, particularly of the pandemic. And speaking to the Icelandic volcano, if I'm honest, I'd completely forgotten about that. And yet, as soon as you said it, I was like, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. I think that crisis side of things is a good point. And one of the things I think from a learning perspective is always coming out of those crises. You're, You're in crisis mode. It's knowing when crisis mode stops as well, because I think teams 
and me personally as an individual, you can get into that. And it's a real approach of living in the minute, in the hour, reacting to things that come up. There has to be a definite point where, as a leader, you say to your teams, right, this isn't a crisis anymore. It's back to business as usual. And that's quite something that really does have that transition. It has to be announced. Otherwise, people can go on in crisis mode. And, and that's not sustainable from a well-being perspective, but also operationally, the two modes aren't necessarily compatible. So if I can leverage and kind of go off script a little bit there, then. Yeah, of course. How do you identify that moment when you kind of go, right, (sighs) we're no longer in crisis mode? How do you identify that? What are the markers for that from your point of view? Because that's a really critical thing. And I think business is still challenged with that. Absolutely. And I think that you're listening to your customers at that point and following the metrics. If your metrics are getting back on track, if you listening to your customers, the feedback from your customers isn't centered so much around what has happened, but looking to the future, then I think at that moment, you have to take stock and say, right, this is perhaps the right moment to announce this and or get everybody to accept the fact that we're moving into a different mode. So listen to the metrics, listen to the customer, and I think they will tell you what's happening and you know, it should fuel and nourish the decision making forward. So before we continue on, I think that's going to be one of the themes of this conversation is that link between employee engagement, customer experience and the contact center in general. So with that in mind, I'm going to shamelessly leverage some of your experience here. You were the head judge on the UK National Contact Center Awards, and that was earlier on this year. What were some of the key themes, lessons and how can organizations who are out there leverage these to really improve on that delivery of customer experience. Sure. Yes, it is. So I've been one of the head judges. There's, there's five of us for the, the CCMA, the UK National Awards, for for a few years now. And I think, I and mean, going back to COVID, it was very different. At that point, you saw again very distinctively organisations were all in crisis mode, and some great stories and some very emotional stories about how they got through that from a colleague and customer perspective. And now moving out, you've got people, and it's rather nice, you can see that optimistically, people are looking at growth again, coming to terms with business as usual, or trying to understand what business as usual is post COVID. And I think difficult for many industries, just in terms of contact center basic, basic of forecasting activity, We've seen that all these poly crises, whatever they're, that they're called these days, has really had an impact on that accessibility because of whether we've got the right staffing, uh, not there's recruitment issues through, throughout the contact center industry and maybe other industries. But I think there's one thread really throughout that. I mean, I was at the stage where it's all the finalists, so some really great stories. And I think throughout this, it's joined up. So fundamentally, all of these are organizations that have realized that customer service, customer experience is absolutely essential to their growth, to their success. It's the locomotive of their commercial success, which I think is a big change compared to probably 15, 20 years ago. But not only that, their approach is joined up internally, and therefore you have the introduction of technology. So it's cyborg or it's it's in its approach there's both technology and there's that uniquely human aspect but then the interconnectivity between the different departments the realization that the feedback and the data coming from those conversations with your customers are extremely important and how they put that into positive mechanisms sorry mechanisms for positive change and for a continuous improvement that throughout All of these different judging sessions that I've done, that has been there and has been, I think, the hallmark of the success. It's those privileged conversations that we have within customer experience with the customers that can fuel that continuous improvement. And the ones who are in the final, uh, part of the final, they're the ones that do that most successfully and leverage the use of information more successfully. It's a really interesting point that you make there, you know, in terms of what you were saying around the industry, the environment and the interconnectedness of those different factors. And I suppose the key factors that influence the effectiveness of any given contact center, environment, accessibility, diversity of spaces, those things, 
And you mentioned it before, the challenges with the great resignation, the challenges we've seen industry-wide in recruiting and retaining staff. I suppose if we've got this big interconnected web of factors, are there any areas that, based on what you've just said, do you feel that maybe need the greatest focus that perhaps are under-serviced in that sense when we look at the industry as a whole? Nothing really springs to mind as something that stands out for that particular question, Sean. It's, I think that, and again, it's I'm very lucky because as a judge, I'm seeing the best examples there where people are really leveraging and they have been successful there. So any cracks that there were or any weaknesses have really been ironed out and they are the shining beacons. I think the issue that we've got there, you say, with the great reason, I think the big issue that we've got, and I think a thread that I'm seeing and people quite honestly saying is that it is a struggle to attract and retain talent now. And that is an issue when you want to offer best-in-class customer service because your turnover, attrition, churn, or whatever you want to call it, is really the worst enemy for offering best-in-class customer service within a contact center environment. So those have been the challenges. I don't think it's necessarily linked to this joined-up approach. I think it is the biggest challenges that we've got currently within the contact center industry. It's just vying for the talent out there to be able to deliver that. So what is good, I think, with a lot of the approaches that I've seen is there's been a big emphasis on colleague experience, on well-being, on EDI, various critical social aspects to ensure that companies can showcase these things to attract and retain talent. So that has actually been extremely positive. And I think that the contact centers are probably at the forefront of that as I think they are in a lot of things in the showcasing of technology, in terms of hybrid working as well. Previously, I've been doing hybrid working uh, with uh, Air France KLM for 10, 12 years. And that proved absolutely fundamental even back then in terms of widening the net, attracting, retaining talent, ensuring that you have a long tenure within the roles to ensure that quality customer experience, those uniquely human interactions, which really do act as the motor for success for your organization. Okay, so let's explore some of that a little bit further, if that's okay. So what I'm thinking here is, I'm a contact center out there in the wild right now, and with all the tools I have available to me, NPS, CSAT, employee engagement surveys, and so on and so forth, how do you assess the true impact and interconnectedness of employee engagement and customer experience? How do you understand what that looks like in the now? And then I suppose the secondary part to that is how do you then use that information to make meaningful change in response to that? Yes, indeed. So I think you've got to look at your metrics here as well, and you've got to have the right metrics. So voice the customer. Previously, this is going back to my Air France KLM days, monitor that on a day-to-day, hour-by-hour, interaction-by-interaction basis as well. So it's extremely good data. At that point, you can map that against people metrics. What I used at the time was a quick dashboard that would be at the end of the day, just in terms of people could quickly say what their experience was as individuals, as colleagues, as employees on a day-to-day basis. So not waiting for the quarterly, the monthly, the yearly employee opinion survey, but having data from an employee, from a colleague perspective, which you could map next to the customer. And what was striking for me is that on days where it was great, I don't know, maybe it was an animation or something that really pulled the teams together, something really positive happened from the colleague side, there was a spike on the customer side as well. Not always, but a definite trend. And likewise, when things were negative for whatever reason, then that could have an impact as well. So you can't correlate that 100% of the time, but there was definitely enough statistical data there to prove that there was that correlation. So it took a long time to get that and have the right mechanisms in place to do that, but it is undoubtedly there. And I think that if you have those mechanisms, then I think that is quite a powerful tool. The next thing is, I mean, those the data from a colleague side was very blunt. It was yes or no, have I had a good experience today? 
So, which is a very blunt instrument. But then I think the critical side for me was that line managers, people managers, every day were looking at that data and then trying to have conversations off the back of that, engaging more with their team to see what were the drivers behind that and trying to put those two things together. And from there on in, committing to and making those changes more rapidly than they would do if you wait for a weekly, a monthly, a quarterly opinion survey from, from colleagues. So for me, that was critical. It's just having those, those right metrics and being able to have the right conversations on the back of that. And I can see what you mean in terms of having the two in parallel. And actually, it's not until you've got the two information streams and the metrics in parallel that you can see the kind of the impact of one on the other. Yeah, absolutely. I can get where you're coming from with that one. I think for me, one of the other things that I'm aware of, one of the other factors that I'm aware of, and it's been a shift that we've seen. And again, I think in large part as a result of the what we saw with the pandemic, we are now much more acutely aware of the fact that we live in an omni-channel world. Customers can be on almost any device. And again, as a result of the pandemic, on almost any platform at almost any time of day and communicating both publicly and privately. We've seen some very good examples whereby customers have had customer experience on a public forum such as Twitter, as an example. So how has that driven a change in customer expectation and I suppose by proxy their customer experience? And I guess in what ways has the industry responded to that change effectively? And again, are there any areas where you see there's a real opportunity for significant improvement? Yeah, so I've seen that. So I think it was something, and again, a frustration, I think, and you can tell that from a colleague experience perspective, if you've got not a proper omni-channel approach, and it's not a joined up approach, the quality of those interactions, frustrating from a customer perspective and also from a frontline colleague experience because they want that for you. And I think that there's a, a slight, we, we talk about the introduction of technology uh, within the contact center as perhaps maybe, oh, you know, should be fearful of it. But no, there, there's a great symbiotic relationship between the two. And I think that colleagues really appreciate a successful integration of technology which will help their day-to-day -day life make it simpler and make their interactions more fruitful with the customer and it's absolutely true what you say just in terms of having that one view of customer and being able to join up the dots and if you'd like alleviate and make easier for the customer to navigate complex organizations then there is a lot of benefit in that i don't think that we are quite i don't think everybody has yet grasped the power of that yet. So I think there is some work still to do on that front and exploiting, and I'll be the first one to express ignorance just in terms of the view of the capabilities of the technology that we sit. So I think within organizations, we perhaps do not scratch the surface just in terms of the potential for the use cases that we've got. And I saw that previously and that the data that we can take out of that, changes that we can implement. And then going back to what I previously said about companies who are award-winning, they have got under the bonnet of that and they appreciate the impact that having that one view, single view of customer, all data joined up and then feeding that information back to product teams, service teams to make those changes, that's really where the added value of that whole approach is. I find that really interesting. One of the things that's been historically, it's been a conversation point and it exploded some years ago, and that was the conversation around this theory of big data. These contact centers, and these businesses have inordinately large amounts of data at their, at their fingertips. And I think it's one of those things that it, for me, certainly, it sits alongside that in parallel. You need to understand what's happening at the macro level, but also at the same time on the micro level, when you're having an interaction with a customer, you want to have all of the relevant information to hand. I don't want to say, oh, I emailed about this previously and not have that person able to identify that or able to respond to that. And you've beautifully answered already my part B of the question, which was how the shift to omnichannel. No, 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 you've jumped ahead. You've beat me to it. And I love that. How has it affected employee engagement? And I think that that's a really important point. I keep saying this and I will keep saying this and I won't apologize for it. No one comes to work to do a bad job. 
No one sets out to do that. But when you're in an environment whereby you either have those tools to really effectively give customers a delightful experience, and I know that sounds twee, but I do mean that sincerely, you contrast that to an environment whereby you don't have the tools or access to be able to do that. And it's easy to see how that would become a frustration and a demotivator for users that would then propel things like resignation, challenges with retention, challenges with recruitment, brain drain, if you like, of your highest experienced staff. So I think it is important to call that out and be aware of it. Yeah. And I think I've seen the most successful integrations of technology, of chatbots in particular, have been where we have had a real good working relationship between those people providing the technology solution and the frontline teams, cutting out the middle management in a way, and then really speaking to the people who do the day to day. And they were great ambassadors for the change that was happening, not viewed as a threat, but seen as something that would bring more value to the work that they did, enable them to deliver better outcomes for the customers. And it all became quite a virtuous circle. So that delivery of that good technology piece within the human framework doesn't need to to clash at any point. It can be done extremely successfully with the right conversations with the right stakeholders. Absolutely. And I think if I think in contrast and in comparison to previous roles that I've had in kind of my early career, I've seen scenarios where a new solution has been brought in and there's been zero engagement with the front lines and you see the, the result there and you compare and contrast that with environments such as you've just discussed, which sounds incredible, where the front lines have been engaged and it's almost been a partnership to deliver and overcome an issue. It's not a foisted on this is you will do this. This is a how can we work together to resolve that? And that partnership, I think, is critical. Because you've mentioned it, I'm going to delve a little deeper into it, if that's okay. We're in the early days, or the nascent days certainly, of chat GPT, artificial intelligence, chatbots, and the onset of of what many are kind of referring to as Bill Gates said it was the biggest sea change in technology since the first personal computer. I suppose through the lens of what we've said about the omni-channel side of things as well, how do you see this affecting the contact center? And I suppose on two fronts, How will this uptake of AI help or hinder CX? And how will that proliferation help or hinder employee engagement, do you feel? Yes, indeed. So I think, and it is really early days. We don't know what that is going to be, what that's going to look like tangibly. But if I look at other big changes that have come along, and I think it's very easy to talk negatively about the impacts. I know when I went from the commercial environment through to a contact center environment, It was really where e-commerce, web sales, that was where there was great growth in that. And people were saying, well, don't go to a contact center because there's going to be no need for contact centers as a result of the proliferation of web sales. But in fact, that was a renaissance for contact centers. So I would see this as a, a, not got a crystal ball. I don't know what it's, it's going to bring. But again, it should not necessarily be a threat, it will bring a lot of great benefits from a customer perspective, but it will also bring from a colleague perspective as well, a lot of benefits to, again, it's a, I think pushing what has happened over the past few years with the self-serve chatbots and things like that, taking perhaps the repetitive, the mundane, and then pushing that perhaps the the more valuable human interactions, which we've seen we need through COVID more than ever, looking after vulnerable customers, people that are on emotional customer experience journeys, for whatever reason, we need that human. So there is, and I think this is the issue that we have to deal with within the contact center environment. We cannot say that contact center advisor, supervisor, manager, the second-class citizens, or it's entry-level jobs, or it's just a call center. It's not their engagement platforms now. It is very difficult to find people that can that take the intensity of those emotional interactions 
with their adaptability, very finely tuned social skills, those are very precious commodities. So there has to be, I think, a change or perhaps an evolution, because I don't think where we were many years ago in that perception externally and also internally in terms of what being in a contact center is all about, because that is that is changing fundamentally. And it's going to become increasingly difficult to find that talent to be able to fuel the interactions that come through because of the success of AI and chat GPT and whatever that may bring for the industry. I think you raised some really interesting points there. It's one of those, it always used to make me cringe. You know, I've been involved in the industry for not far off 15 years. And it was always the your story at the very beginning. I, it came in as a nine month contract and I kind of clocked that in my head. And I was like, I remember that. I came straight out of university with my degree, realized that David Attenborough had my job already and I wasn't going to get it. And I was like, I'll go and work in a call center for a couple of months. And lo and behold, here I am with a career that I'm immensely proud of but not necessarily one I set out to achieve. I've got skills that I've developed and honed over that time. And whenever I hear someone say, oh, it's just a call center, like I feel my hackles go up on the back of my neck and I get very defensive about it. And I think it ties into something that I saw you've talked about previously, which is around contact center mergers, outsourcing as vehicles for savings on outgoings. So I guess, the, the challenge there, and there's two parts to this. Number one, if you go with down that route, you've got that advantage that that work exists on the other party or it's re- diminished in some way, shape or form. But I suppose if a company, you know, this company X out there is looking at that as an option, how do they ensure that they retain that customer experience? Because that's effectively their brand, which is one of their most valuable resources. So on the one hand, you've got reduction in challenge with recruitment and retention. But on the other hand, you've got this preservation of brand. Yeah, indeed. Absolutely. How do how? So I spent the last few years working with outsourced partners as we changed our operational footprint over Air France KLM and now in an outsourced company. And I am really heartened by the fact that we have a very proficient, experienced team of what I would brand ambassadors that can work as an extension of a company and help them with their customer experience strategy. So it is a partnership. And I think that for any company working for this is going back to my experience with Air France KLM, you have to work really closely. Uh, You have to work really closely and create that partnership, that meaningful partnership where you are communicating on a daily, on an hourly basis and feeding back information, both sides to make those improvements. The difficulty you've got is making the brand, making the values come alive with your partners. And I think there's some really experienced and skillful teams out there. And Whistle is one of them, I'm pleased to say, having been there for a month, where they can make those customer experiences and values come alive very adeptly because they work very closely with our clients, with our partners. And it's that relationship that you can build up and take a lot of the strain off as well because the forecasting activity and an upscaling for seasonality, that's extremely difficult. So take a lot of the pain away. Difficult part is that longer term piece the relationship building, and to ensure that the values echoed and are very present in those interactions. And that is the golden thread that holds together that customer experience. Um, Yeah, I couldn't have said it better myself. (laughs) Great answer. (laughs) You win. (laughs) Okay, I'm conscious of time. Unfortunately, our time is drawing to a close. So I've got one final question for you, which is try and end on on a bright, hopeful note. The industry we're in, 80% of traffic is still calls. The AI revolution is, as you say, more likely to be a renaissance rather than a revolution. The industry is tracking to achieve significant growth over the coming years. That's going to need a new generation of leaders. So what characteristics or personality traits do you feel help any given individual really stand out to you as someone to watch as a forthcoming leader? Passion. Absolutely. It's an enthusiasm. The great thing about contact centers, you open the door, a good contact center, it's tangible. You can feel it. You've got a group of 
customer experience professionals working tirelessly to promote the brands that they're supporting. And you can feel that. Couple that enthusiasm with a real passion, not only for the product, the brand, the company, but interacting with colleagues to improve outcomes, to coach. Leadership is a very different beast to what it was 20 years ago. Absolutely. You have to be able to engage authentically across multiple stakeholders. So starting off, and I think this is why a lot of people that started off on the phones have seamlessly perhaps moved into leadership positions because those foundations are there. That ability to interact and be authentic with customers is there. For the leaders, you're taking it to the leadership, you're taking it to the next level insofar as that becomes authentic. You can have to work as a coach, you have to be a first aider sometimes, you have to give guidance, you have to give vision. But fundamentally, you can learn that those foundations there, that authenticity, that ability to engage and to adapt with people is there for the majority of customer service professionals. Excellent. And I feel like that's a fantastic place to wrap up for this session. Um, I thank you hugely for joining me today. Thank you, Sean. And yeah, I look forward to following the, the journey that you're on. So yeah, thank you ever so much for your time. Thanks very much. Much appreciated. Talk Time is brought to you by Max Contact. To find out more about Max Contact and how our customer engagement software can help you and your teams provide smarter customer experiences, visit maxcontact.com and book your personalized demo today. Be sure to search Talk Time with Max Contact in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found, and leave us a positive rating to help other like-minded individuals join the conversation. Finally, before you go, never miss a future episode by clicking the subscribe button and turning on notifications. On behalf of the team here at Max Contact, Thanks for listening.